welcome. Welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. We call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. Our church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be good to all conscious beings, and we believe in good because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds good to you, then you are probably in the right place. So the way we do it is the members ourselves give the talks. We have a planning meeting about once every three months that everyone is invited to attend. And, um, and then what we'll do is we'll have a 20 to 30 minute talk. Afterwards, we will form the chairs into a circle. We'll have a non-led uh, discussion, which uh, we'll explain how we do that when it's time. Uh, and then we'll do that for about an hour, and then afterwards we'll break again if people want to talk individually or whatever they're welcome to. Okay, so our movie, which we have first Friday of every month, our movie this last month was Jane. If you haven't seen it, there are a few movies made about the life of Jane Goodall. This is her favorite, and um, absolutely fantastic. So thank you for suggesting that movie. Um, and then uh, we also go once a month out drinking to Browers, um, so check on the website if you're interested in joining us for that. Uh, if you'd like to support the church financially, there's a jar at the back of the room, and also Troy, who's in the back right there, has a credit card swiper, or you can donate off Meetup. If you were new today, as I see a lot of new faces, please don't, you know, uh, realize that we don't expect you to get, contribute any money. But at whatever point you're coming regularly and you want to, we use it just to pay for this room. Okay, without further ado, uh, the talk is Enlightenment Now. Uh, come on. All right. I'm going to start with a book. And you have to guess who said it. So let me start with a quote. Um, if you had to choose a moment in history to be born, and you did not know ahead of time who you would be, you didn't know whether you were going to be born into a wealthy family or a poor family, what country you'd be born in, whether you're going to be a man or a woman, if you had to choose blindly what moment you'd want to be born, you choose now. So, people are shaking their heads. Wait, wait, slow down, we'll get to that. Who, who do you think, who said that? Where, where do you think the quote, oh, I, do, you know, do you know who said it? The Rawls. Oh, close, good, yeah, because it sounds like, you know, the whole, yeah. Um, oh, Ada, you, do you know who said the quote? I don't know. <laughs> John? Stephen Pinker. No, okay, so this is actually, a, oh, yes, please. Yes, thank you, Barack Obama 2016. Yay, Barack Obama. All right, nice. Um, all right, so today um, I'm going to be talking about Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now. Um, apparently this is Bill Gates' favorite book of all time. Um, and uh, the book has a really, really um, simple thesis, um, really easy to understand. The thesis of the book is that we, humanity, have been making incredible, uh, an incredible amount of progress in the last couple of hundred years. Um, we live longer, we're healthier, we're safer, we're wealthier, we are freer, we are smarter, and we are happier uh, than any time in human history. That's part one of the thesis. The other part of the thesis is, um, and this progress was made possible by ideas from the Enlightenment. Um, in particular, it was made possible by a belief in reason, science, and humanism. Um, and that's what explains this incredible progress that we've made. So in this talk, what I'm going to do is, the bulk of the talk is, it's a 700 page book, it's a long book, so obviously I'm not going to go, be able to go through all of it. What I want to do is, I want to spend some time though, um, in the first part, talking about the data that he presents to prove to everyone that, you know, believe it or not, the world is getting massively better every day. 
And then at the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about the Enlightenment ideas that he thinks added to that. And then finally, I'm going to end on the subject of atheism, which is an important part of, of the position that he's defending. So let me start with the, uh, the data. So Pinker writes, and here is a shocker. The world has, been made, it has made spectacular progress in every single measure of human well-being. Here is a second shocker. Almost no one knows about it. So let's talk about all the different ways that you don't know the world is getting better. Let's start with life expectancy. So for 99% of human existence, for thousands of years, the average life expectancy for a human being was about 30 years old. Um, and that's still true if you look at you know, tribes in Africa who still follow uh, traditional practices. It's around 29 years is the average life expectancy. Um, but uh, the average world life expectancy, and realize that this takes into account infant mortality, death from wars and disease, everything. This is the world life expectancy. Here we go. It's now 71 years old for the entire world. Yes, that's really, really good. Uh, so life expectancy around the world shot up in the 1800s. It started to shoot up in the Western countries, but actually, you know, the whole world followed pretty quickly. Um, take, for example, Kenya. Kenya's a, Kenya is an amazing story. Life expectancy in Kenya increased by almost 10 years between the years 2003 and 2013. Now, if you pause for a moment and think about that, this is kind of weird because it means that if you're a Kenyan, after having lived, loved, and struggled for a whole decade, the average person in Kenya had not lost a single year of their remaining lifetime. Everyone got 10 years older, yet death had not come a step closer. So it's like getting a free 10 year period of, of life because the life expectancy grew. That's kind of cool. Um, so traditionally, one of the main reasons that the average life expectancy was so low was because of the child mortality rate. And this is just horrible. Again, for 99% of human existence, about half of all children died before reaching adulthood. Half. Half of the children died before reaching adulthood. And then a really remarkable thing happened in the past 100 years. The child mortality rates dropped by 100-fold. So currently in the developed world, the child mortality rate is at 1%. So it's less than 1% in the United States. Um, for the rest of the world in developing countries, it's around 4%. Still high, but we've gone from 50% down to 4%. So that's an incredible improvement. Um, and this is what Pinker has to say about this. Here's a quote from Pinker. The loss of a child is among the most devastating experiences. Imagine the tragedy, then try to imagine it another million times. That's a quarter of the number of children who did not die last year alone, who would have died had they been born 15 years earlier. Now repeat, 200 times or so for the years since the decline in child mort mortality begun. Graphs like the one that shows the child mortality graph display a triumph of human well-being whose magnitude the mind cannot begin to comprehend. And it's true. I mean, we have, you know, you can imagine the death of one child. It's a horrible thing. But it's really hard for us to project our imagination into thinking, you know, what are the moral consequences of preventing the death of 100 children or 1,000 or a million? Uh, it's just mind-boggling uh, how, how much more, you know, goodness we've introduced into the world. Let's talk about health. So we're living longer. Are we healthier? And the answer is yes. For the, again, for the vast majority of human history, the number one cause of death for humans is, and still true, is uh, diseases, um, and especially infectious diseases. So uh, what Pinker writes is, ever creative homo sapiens had long fought back against disease with quackery, such as prayer, sacrifice, bloodletting, cupping, toxic metals, homeopathy, and squeezing a hen to death against an infected body part. I don't, I don't know who tried that, but um, I guess, I'm guessing it didn't work. Um, but starting in the late 18th century with the invention of vaccination and accelerating in the 19th with acceptance of the germ theory of disease, the tide of battle began to turn. Hand washing, midwifery, mosquito control, and especially the protection of drinking water by public sewage and chlorinated tap water would come to save billions of lives. So we're talking billions here. Um, let's just look at one example, smallpox. Everyone knows the story here. Smallpox in the 20th century alone killed 300 million people in the 20th century. 
Um, guess how many people it's killing now? Yes, zero, absolutely zero, because we, we cured it. There's no more smallpox. Um, guess how much it costs to cure? Um, it was estimated that it costs only about $312 million to come up with a cure for smallpox, which is about the same cost as five Hollywood blockbuster movies. So for that amount of money, about 32 cents of life, uh, we were able to save you know, millions and millions of lives. So that's an incredibly positive story. Um, yay, science. Uh, let me give another uh, example. Guinea worm. Guinea worm, if you've ever read about it, it's horrible. I mean, I just, I can't imagine this. Let me describe it just to make you squeamish and feel awful. Here we go. I'm going to make you feel squeamish. So this is the way guinea worm works. It's a parasite that worms its way into your lower limbs. So it like gets into your leg. And then what it does is it creates a uh, painful blister. And then when you put your leg into the water, uh, what happens is the blister bursts and all these larvae come swimming out. Um, and the only way to cure a person of guinea worm, this, it takes days or weeks, but they have to slowly unspool this you know, three-foot worm out of your body and pull it out. So incredibly painful. Uh, guinea worm, um, in 1986, there were 3.5 million cases of guinea worm in 21 countries. So it's not a rare disease. 3.5 million, that's many times the population of the city of Seattle. It's like taking everyone in the city of Seattle and multiplying it you know, a bunch of times. That's the number of people who had guinea worm. They had to experience you know, all the fun of having a giant worm in them and having to pull it out. Lots of suffering. So hopefully everyone is feeling you know, squeamish at this point. Guess how many cases of guinea worm there were there in 2016? Yes? About 97? That, that's very close. Uh, according to Pinker, there's 25 cases in three countries. So yeah, close Thank enough. Thank you, Jimmy Carter. Yes, absolutely. It's Jimmy Carter. Everyone applaud Jimmy Carter. Thank you. Uh, huge fan. When Pinker wrote this, they were down to about three. Uh, when he was writing this in 2017, they had only had three reported cases so far. So it's very, very quickly becoming eradicated, going the way of smallpox. So these are not minor changes. These are having a huge effect on human happiness throughout the world. Um, science, go science. Let's talk about famine. Famine. Uh, now, in 1798, um, Thomas Malthus explained that the frequent famines of his era were unavoidable. It would only get worse because, quote, here's the famous Malthus quote, population, when unchecked, increases in a geometrical ratio, but subsistence increases only in an arithmetic ratio. A slight acquaintance with numbers will show the immensity of the first power in comparison with the second. So you've all heard these fears before, right? So as the population, as the poor reproduce so quickly, geometrically, um, the population will explode, but our food supply can only go up, you know, arithmetically. And so the right thing to do, the compassionate thing to do, is be mean to poor people. Don't give them any medicine. Don't feed them because they were just making the problem worse. Uh, that was the Malthus position, and unfortunately, it had a huge effect on political philosophy as well. Um, don't feed the poor people. Um, so, uh, in 1947, 50% of the world population were undernourished. Um, currently, only 13%. That's still a lot, but you need to take into consideration that during that same 70 year period, that we went from 50% to 13%, we also added 5 billion people to the planet. So, there's 5 billion people more that they're feeding, and we're feeding them more effectively. So, how did Malthus get things wrong? Um, he got things wrong uh, for two reasons. Uh, number one, uh, what he didn't take into account is when uh, richer people have fewer babies. Uh, and that's reproduced over and over again. Uh, remember, about 50% of children used to die before adulthood. So if you were raising a family, it makes sense to have a lot of children because um, unfortunately, about half of them would die. And that no, that's no longer true. And in richer countries, people have smaller families. So he was wrong about that. But the other more important thing he was wrong about was the science. It turns out that we can produce food at a geometric progression. So in fact, in 1909, Carl Bosch and Fritz Haber discovered how to produce fertilizer at an industrial scale, at a geometric scale. So it used to be, you know, fertilizer, we would use, what's it called, night soil. I always love that. They would use night soil, which is basically human poop that they would take out and throw into the farmlands, um, or bird droppings or whatever to create fertilizer to be able to effectively uh, grow, uh, you know, grow food. But they discovered a process where they could extract nitrogen and produce artificial fertilizer. Um, Pinker writes, these two chemists 
Top the list of the 20th century scientists who saved the greatest number of lives in history. They saved about 2.7 billion lives by their invention of the, of the method for pulling out nitrogen and producing fertilizer. Um, so at this point, thanks to the Green Revolution, the world needs less than a third of the land it used to need to produce a given amount of food. Uh, we might, this is what Pinker writes, we might have reached peak farmland at this point. What he means by peak farmland is we may never need to use more farmland than we have today to be able to feed the world's population. And remember, he's taking, he's assuming that the population will be expanding as quickly as it has because as countries become more affluent, they have less babies, and we've also become so much more uh, productive at producing food. So, uh, that's good news. <laughs> Uh, violence. Let's talk about violence. So violence covers a lot of um, areas. It covers homicide, it covers war. Um, let's, uh, but regardless uh, the type of violence, Pinker writes, as of the first decade of the 21st century, every objective measure of violence has been in decline. So let's start with war. Um, so if you look at a graph of the number of deaths by war, um, not surprisingly, you'll see World War II. And it'll be way up here, and then after it, it just plummets, and then it moves along like this. Uh, so the number of battle deaths uh, were 300 deaths per 100,000 during World War II. It's plummeted to today about 1.2 deaths per 100,000. Pinker talked about this also in his earlier book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. But one of the big changes that we did is we started to respect borders. And it used to be wars were very common because countries were invading borders left and right. Um, we changed our attitudes about that. And so there are far fewer wars today uh, than there were you know, previously because people just don't, you know, there's some exceptions to that, obviously, but people don't um, invade countries in the same way as they used to. Um, the, uh, the other, uh, let's see, the, oh, the other cause of violence is, of course, homicides. Uh, being murdered on the street or whatever homicide there is. Uh, with the exception of the world wars, more people are killed in homicides than wars. So more people are, um, are killed through um, homicides. Um, so Pinker writes, though numbers for the entire world exist only for this millennium and include heroic guesstimates for countries that are data deserts, the trend appears to be downward as well. From 8.8 .8 homicides per 100,000 people in 2000 to 6.2 in 2012, that means there are 180,000 people walking around today who would have been murdered just in the last year if the global homicide rate had remained at its level of a dozen years before. So you're safer now, safer walking the street. Um, and he actually has a lot of interesting stuff to say actually about homicide and crime and how it works and what we've done to, to prevent it. Uh, anyway, moving on, prosperity. So, Pinker writes, the story of the growth of prosperity in human history is close to nothing, nothing, nothing. Repeat for a few thousand years, boom, all of a sudden going up. A millennium after the year 1 CE, the world was barely richer than it was at the time of Jesus. The gross world product today has grown almost a hundredfold since the Industrial Revolution was in place in 1820, and almost 200-fold from the start of the Enlightenment in the 18th century. Um, in 200 years, the rate of extreme poverty in the world has tanked from 90% to 10%, with almost half that decline occurring in the last 35 years. Uh, so, uh, as this is an anecdote, but it struck me when reading the book, um, he points out that today, about half of the adults in the world own a smartphone. Not one of those cheap, you know, handphones. They own a full-on smartphone. Half of the adults living in the world um, own a smartphone. That's pretty amazing. That means they have access to the internet. They have access to all sorts of things that, I mean, you know, a dude walking around the middle of Borneo now can, you know, read anything on the internet. Read the New York Times. That's pretty amazing if you think about that. Um, so what explains this massive increase in prosperity? According to Pinker, the most obvious cause was the application of science to the improvement of material life. And he gives a lot of examples of that. Happiness. Let's move on to happiness. So don't listen to all those songs. All those songs are wrong. Money can buy you happiness. It can buy you happiness. Uh, and we know this from data, from a number of different surveys. Um, not only are richer people in a given country happier, but people in richer countries are happier. And as countries get richer over time, their people get happier. 
those are three different statements, by the way. But those, those are three different statements. But in general, money correlates with happiness. This new understanding has come from several independent analysis, including one by Angus Eaton, the World Value Survey, and the World Happiness Report of 2016. We're not only happier now, we're also smarter. So how did that happen? Um, so humans are getting smarter every year, uh, according to something called the Flynn Effect. And Flynn was actually, he was a philosopher. Uh, he discovered this effect in the 1980s. People didn't really believe in the Flynn effect, but now there's an overwhelming amount of evidence to show that's true. Um, every decade, and this is true for the world population, not just in the United States, every decade, everyone gets three points smarter. That's really cool. They're three points smarter. Um, Pinker writes, it beggars belief to think that an average person of 1910, if he or she had entered a time machine and materialized today, would be borderline retarded by our standards. While if Joe and Jane Average made the reverse journey, they would outsmart 98% of the befrocked and bewhiskered Edwardians who greeted them as they emerged. Uh, so that is kind of mind-boggling. Um, anyway, so the explanation of why IQ is, uh, is going up, um, there's a lot of different explanations, we're not sure, but we think it's for the same reason as uh, human height keeps increasing, better nutrition, all of that, that people are healthier and so they're getting smarter and taller. Um, accidents. Uh, so I just want to mention car accidents, another huge killer of people in the United States. Um, self-driving cars, expected to save you know, over a million lives. Um, yay, self-driving cars. Um, but how about things like lightning bolts? That's the prototypical, prototypical example of something coming from the blue. It's a lightning bolt. So there's no way to control that. Surely reason and science and humanism can't solve lightning bolts, can they? How many people think that fewer people are dying of lightning bolts today? Thank you, Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. Yes, in fact, you know, science can make a difference. Uh, if you look at lightning bolts, uh, thanks to urbanization and to advances in weather prediction, safety education, medical treatment, and electrical systems, there has been a 37-fold decline since the turn of the 20th century in the chance that an American will be killed by a bolt of lightning. So you're actually much safer today um, from lightning bolts. All right, so that's it on the data. So hopefully everyone will agree that uh, this shows an amazing amount of progress, right? And it's all happened uh, since you know the 1800s, since the period of the Enlightenment. So, so what's the explanation for all of this, you know, great stuff? Why are we so much happier and wealthier and you know healthier today? Um, well, according to Pinker again, he says that there's one thing that explains everything: it's the ideas of the Enlightenment, in particular, a belief in reason science and humanism. Um, and he argues that's the belief in supernatural religion uh, that's incompatible with all three of these Enlightenment ideas. And so he devotes a chapter to um, defending the Enlightenment uh, against religion on all three of these areas. Um, I'm going to summarize those three chapters with a single paragraph for purposes of time. Uh, but what Pinker writes is, the most obvious alternative to reason, science, and humanism is religious faith. To take something on faith means to believe it without good reason. So by definition, a faith in the existence of supernatural entities clashes with reason. Religions also commonly clash with humanism whenever they elevate some moral good above the well-being of humans, such as accepting a divine savior, ratifying a sacred narrative, enforcing rituals and taboos, proselytizing other people to do the same, and punishing or demonizing those who don't. Religions can also clash with humanism by valuing souls above lives, which is not as uplifting as it sounds. Belief in an afterlife implies that health and happiness are not such a big deal because life on earth is an infinitesimally, infinitesimal portion of one's existence. That coercing people into accepting salvation is doing them a favor. And that martyrdom might be the best thing that they could ever happen to you. As for incompatibilities with science, these are the stuff of legend and current events, from Galileo and the Scopes monkey trial to stem cell research and climate change. Um, okay, so Pinker believes that all of the human progress that we have accomplished over the last couple of hundred of years, including moral progress, because this is moral progress, is a result of humanism. He writes, the goal of maximizing human flourishing, life, health, happiness, freedom, knowledge, love, richness of experience, may be called humanism. That's how he's defining the word. There is a growing movement called humanism. Um, he's now writing that with capital H, which promotes a non-supernatural basis for meeting and ethics, 
good without God. This humanism, which is inextricable from a scientific understanding of the world, is becoming the de facto morality of modern democracies, international organizations, and liberalized, and liberalized religions. And its unfulfilled promises define the moral imperatives we face today. All right, so final chapter of his book, he talks about atheism. And so, since this is an atheist church, um, I want to talk a little bit about what he says in that chapter. Um, he points out that although technically atheism is a lack of belief in God, and not a positive belief, who, um, but he says the, the beliefs of atheists and humanists actually tend to overlap. Um, so he says that in the context of criticizing dead. Um, so, uh, but the thing that surprised me about this chapter is he's marshaled together a lot of evidence that atheism is actually growing rapidly. Um, I didn't realize that. So, Pinker writes, the world's fastest growing religion is no religion at all. According to Wynne Gallup International's Global Index of Religiosity and Atheism, a survey of 50,000 people in 57 countries, 13% of the world's population identified themselves as a, quote, convinced atheist. So this is stronger than being a nun, right? So a lot of people report themselves as nun, not as in N-U-N, but in, in O N D. <laughs> sorry, but to clarify, but this is stronger than just saying they're unaffiliated. These are people who are saying that they are a convinced atheist, which, you know, uh, is a strong, much stronger statement. Um, so it's, it's gone from about 10% of the population to 13% of the world population. Um, and this is very, very, uh, it's not, of course, evenly distributed across countries. Um, in Australia, Canada, France, Hong Kong, Ireland, Japan, the Netherlands, Sweden, and several other countries, religious people are now in the minority. Uh, and atheists make up a quarter to more than half of the population. So, I don't know, Ireland's sounding pretty good. How can Ireland be on that list? Now I'm confused, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, uh, other Western democracies have two to six times the proportion of atheists found in the United States. Um, in the U.S., atheists were less than 1% of the population in the 1950s, 10% of the population in 2007, and 16% of the population in 2014. So 16, that's pretty good. All right, so why aren't atheists more prominent? Um, and why do people think the number of atheists are declining? And why do you see all those articles about you know, the, uh, the comeback of religion and all of that? Uh, well, Pinker has a simple explanation for that. Um, atheists don't vote. That's a problem. So, uh, according to his research, in, 20, in 2012, re religiously unaffiliated Americans uh, make up about 20% of the population, but only 12% of them voted. So, only 12% of the, 12 of the uh, non-religiously affiliated, which, again, is a little weaker than a you know, firm atheist, but people who aren't religiously affiliated voted in. But in the same year, in 2012, white evangelical Protestants also made up 20% of the adult population, but they made up 26% of the voters, more than double the proportion of the irreligious. So atheists don't vote, religious people do. Why do religious people vote more than atheists? A simple explanation, they're part of an organized religion, and organized religions are organized. And so that means that they can organize their members to go out and vote for causes, and so they can have more an effect on the world around them. All right, which brings us back to, let, let me get to the conclusion, uh, the need for an atheist church. Thank you, everyone, for coming to an atheist church today. So we can promote you know, the ideals of the Enlightenment. Um, so uh, one way to summarize Pinker's book is like this. Quote, I'm quoting myself now, I'll still say quote. Um, for 99% of human existence, life on Earth was really, really bad. It really sucked. Half of children died before reaching adulthood, Huge numbers of people died as a result of war, famine, and disease, and people eked out a brief and miserable existence. Um, and then we embraced the enlightenment. We stopped explaining the world by appealing to supernatural forces, and all of our lives became demonstrably better. There's no more smallpox. Our average life expectancy has gone from 30 to 70. Humans around the world are happier, and we get struck by lightning far less often. <laughs> Uh, so if we want to continue this progress, and this is moral progress under any sane definition of moral progress, then we need to continue to promote and organize a community around Enlightenment ideals, such as a belief in reason, evidence, and science. This is the purpose of our church, the Atheist Church.